Um, my name's Tim. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, some stuff I've been working on in Fedora, um, which is classifying OpenQA test results and doing that using some AML techniques. So what I'm looking to talk about is do a bit of an introduction, um, talk about phase one, phase two, some of the ongoing uh, related work that uh, I've been doing, and uh, leave some time at the end for questions. So um, introduction, um, just even going into the stuff that's in the title. So OpenQA. OpenQA is a testing system. It works uh, primarily on computer vision. It's something that was originally created um, by the folks at SUSE, um, but at this point, Fedora uses it heavily, um, and we do participate upstream as well. The core thing of OpenQA is that it works off of computer vision. Um, so where uh, l most other test systems, um, it's going to be text-based, this ends up becoming quite a bit more visual. Um, as, a, as a way to kind of look at this, um, you know, you can write a test step within OpenQA. If you look at the, the Firefox icon, um, you write it as, okay, if you can find this little image in the big image, which is the system under test, move the mouse there and click. Um, you know, there, and this is the, the, the basic building block upon which most OpenQA tests are written. So when I talk about results, um, the system, uh, when, you, uh, when you have results, you have your obvious status. Did it pass? Did it fail? Did it crash? Um, there's text output that comes from the system. Um, and the, the, but the stuff that I'm more interested in at this point is the visual parts. So there's a sequence of screenshots every time it does one of those comparisons, you know, asking the question of, you know, can you find this little image in the big image? It takes a screenshot and saves it. So you end up with a sequence of screenshots that go from beginning all the way through to the end. That is a representation of the test and what happened. Um, another thing that comes out is a video of the entire process. Um, this is done in virtual machines. So there is a video of uh, from the, 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 the output, the graphical output from the virtual machine from the moment that the test starts to the moment that the virtual machine is turned off. But for uh, the moment, the thing I'm really interested in is this sequence of screenshots. So talking about a classifier. Um, in its simple case, and the case I'm most interested in for the, the context of this talk, is a binary classifier. So taking an input, determining which of two classes it belongs to. Uh, it's a problem that's very similar is you know, something that I think all of us are familiar with is a CAPTCHA. Um, is a kind of binary classifier where you're trying to find, you know, in this case, is it a crosswalk? Is it not a crosswalk? So you can classify each one of those, you know, starting from the top. It's like, okay, crosswalk, not a crosswalk, not a crosswalk, crosswalk, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and that is, you know, the, the, the idea of a uh, binary classifier. So getting into more of what we're trying to solve. The Fedora's OpenQA instance runs a lot of jobs. So far this year, um, we've been doing over 1,700 jobs per day. The triage of that falls on to mostly two people, both of whom has a, have other things to do. Um, so there's you know, quite a bit of work. And if we can make this triage process more efficient, if we can get the computer to do at least some of their work, that means they have more time to do their other work, or we can even start expanding the amount of testing we're doing um, because there's, uh, they're able to do the triage work more efficiently and we're not overwhelming them. Which gets us to the problem statement. Can we use you know, AML te techniques um, in an automated way to, redu to reduce the load on uh, the humans who are doing the triage work when some of these jobs fail, or w the tests fail? Which brings us into the, fir the first phase. Could this actually work? In 2022, we were presented with an opportunity. Um, well, it's an opportunity in retrospect. It was not as fun at the time. Um, we had an intermittent, intermittent issue in the production instance where jobs would just crash. Basically, there was some intera bad interaction between X and Firefox, so in the middle of a test, X would just die and it would go to a terminal. And when you're doing these comparisons um, visually, you know, if you're at a terminal, you're not going to be able to find the Firefox icon, and tests would just die. Um, these failures weren't relevant to what we were trying to test, so um, it was, you know, we needed to figure out a way to get, you know, interesting information. Um, do the nature of the tests, 
um, were that there was no text evidence that it had happened. Nothing showed up in any log files. There was nothing we could grep. There's nothing we could use. Um, you know, the, the first things you think of, you know, none of that would work. So um, the people who were doing the triage had to go through these things and reschedule all of these um, failed jobs by hand until either those jobs passed or they failed to uh, a different issue that was relevant to the tests that were being run. Um, as you can imagine, uh, that was quite a bit of work. <laughs> um, so uh, this kind of where this started from was this idea of, well, you know, can we make it easier? But um, this also produces a data set um, that because uh, the, the, the human triagers were going through and doing the rescheduling, they've created the data set already. Um, and so we end up being, uh, so basically the, um, the, the root truth for being able to do the experiments, so we know which ones were rescheduled, we know which ones were not rescheduled, um, and it presents with a, uh, a cheap data set um, that we can run an experiment with. So um, getting into why you know, this kind of experiment is, uh, in terms of like research into classifying uh, test results, that has you know, historically just been uh, more text-based because most testing systems, most tests are written um, to work with text. So um, we, so getting into this, instead of jumping right in and saying, all right, we're gonna go full, you know, full into this, we're gonna spend all, you know, all this time, all this money on creating a data set and doing an experiment that's, that's gonna be great, um, we'll start with something small. You know, we have this data set that's basically been made for us. Um, let's see if the small thing can work before we jump into the big thing. Um, and as I said, so we have the, uh, the, the, the data set already. You know, the, our two classes are going to be either it was rescheduled or it's not rescheduled. Now, one of the natural questions, I think, from this is, um, is it safe to actually just assume that all the things that were supposed to be rescheduled were rescheduled? And I would say safe enough for what we're doing. Um, in practice, um, when we're talking about Fedora, um, all Bodhi updates either need, to pay, either need to pass tests or they need to be waived by hand. And because the, the, the folks doing the triage were going through the failed tests to find the things that needed to be rescheduled multiple times per day, um, and it takes effort for a maintainer to actually go into the system, figure out how to wave something, and then actually wave it. I would assert that there's not enough packages that fell through this that were waved manually. I don't think there are too many maintainers who are like, oh, those tests failed. No, nah, I'm going to push it anyways. Um, I'm sure I'm, that, has that happened. I'm sure, I imagine it has. Um, but basically coming to, I would assert that it's not... Uh, there aren't enough of those occurrences to affect results in a meaningful way. So the phase one, the best way to, to sum it up is what is the simplest possible experiment we could do to answer the question of, are there, you know, are, does this idea have legs? Is there enough data in the visual output from OpenQA tests to actually classify the failures um, one way or another? Um, the idea being, again, that if this simple experiment, if the simplest possible thing doesn't work, there's no point in doing the more expensive, more difficult thing. But if the simple experiment works, then more research is justified. So the data we used for this, um, I gathered all the jobs that ran in a two-week period. Um, it's about 102 gigabytes of raw data without any of the videos. A um, little over 30, uh, 31,000 jobs, uh, 2,400 failed. And of those failed failures, or of those failures, um, it's about 75-25% split between the two classes. Um, and just kind of emphasize of the, the amount of work, you know, that means that we have you know, 250 jobs per week that someone has to go through and reschedule. Um, on top of the other real tri you know, triage of you know, figuring out why the test failed, um, on top of that work. So keeping with the theme of let's do the simplest thing possible, um, went with a, a three-layer CNN. It is simple, 
And when I say simple, I mean really simple. This is the kind of model you would find on, oh, you're using PyTorch for the first time. Here, create this model. That's the level of simplicity we're talking about. But that's the whole reason for this experiment. What is the simplest possible thing we could do to answer the question? But with that simplicity comes with a limitation. Um, that kind of a, a, of a neural network um, can only accept one input. It, so for one input, you get one output. It can't understand sequences. It doesn't understand time. So we need to be able to go from this sequence of screenshots, which is multiple things, to a single input that this simple uh, model can understand. So that's where we come to this idea of composite screenshots. And it's you know, nothing fancy, but the idea is to tessellate and to organize these screenshots to go from a sequence to one image um, that's going to end up being the same um, aspect ratio. So, so the distortion is minimized. Um, and then scale that composite screenshot to the size that we want to use as input. Here's an example of you can see the screenshots as the test goes on from you know, the top left to bottom right. And you just have the sequence of what happened with the test um, until you fill out uh, the square. And because it's not, the number of screenshots aren't a perfect square, you, know, you end up with white space. It's just a visualization of the simple model. Again, three layers of CNN, um, relatively standard other stuff. Um, in terms of configuration, um, there, were, there are several things from you know, the model sizes to, or I'm sorry, the, the layer sizes to the batch size to um, other uh, tunables. We ended up uh, sorry, with all of those things. An exhaustive search over that space meant we had 576 experiments to run um, per input size. Again, kind of summarizing. So we have our cheap data set. Um, we have our goal. We have our simple classifier. And um, what we want to do is look at uh, two different sizes of image. One is the same size that the original uh, screenshots were, and then doubling that to see you know, if we give it more information, does the performance improve? All right, so results. Um, I think this thing did really well. Um, and you can see that, yes, there is an improvement with you know, going from the single, re single resolution to double resolution. You know, all the you know, metrics are better. But there's something else that also went up. So from an ad, and this is for like number of minutes to do the full train test cycle. You know, we went from 18 minutes on average to 90 minutes on average, which is slightly different. Um, and you know, we kind of end up with a sort of conclusion of, yes, the performance is better, but it comes at a cost. Um, so you know, I would say you know, it really depends on application. For this kind of an application, I imagine you'd be retraining at most every two weeks. So you know, if you're spending 90 minutes of computer time every two weeks, eh, I'd say the cost is negligible. You know, if we were doing that 50 times a day, that's a whole different story. So for this application, I would argue that um, the extra compute time needed uh, to get that improvement is probably worth it. Just to kind of uh, emphasize the number of things um, that were run, with the two sizes, um, it was almost 1,200 uh, different runs and 560 hours of computer time um, used to run the experiments. So getting into just talking about the, the, the end of this phase one, the results were pretty good. Um, I would say it indicates that more research is warranted. Um, could those numbers be improved? Almost definitely, yes. Um, I can think of a bunch of things that could be done to improve those numbers. But I would argue it's not worth the effort to you know, chase those numbers. Because we got into the next part of this is practicality. When this experiment started, it wasn't meant to be practical. It was meant to answer the question of, you know, what is the s simplest possible thing we could do to see if more research is warranted? And you know, that was this. But you know, again, practicality. If you, we come back to the crosswalk analogy, you know, pretend for a second you could train a bird 
solve uh, you know the crosswalk captcha. So you know you figure out um, your training scheme and what the rewards are and all that kind of stuff, and the bird can successfully identify okay that's a crosswalk, that's not a crosswalk, that's not a crosswalk, so on and so forth. And you're really proud; it works really great. And then your next capture, you have to find the buses. And you know the bird's not going to do so well at that. And it's you know, why this is not terribly practical. Um, not only is it you have to know what issue you're trying to find duplicates of before you start, um, but you have to have you know hundreds, if not a thousand, examples of that duplicate failure before you can find more duplicates. And at least in my experience, that kind of situation where you have that much data on a single failure that's happening that often it really does need to be fixed. And if it, if you come across that on a regular basis, there's probably more dysfunction in that organization um, than you're going to fix with, you know, a bit of AIML. But this does lead into the second phase. Could this idea be practical? What is the next part of the research we want to do? And I would change the problem statement to, can we reliably cluster these failures by root cause? Um, when I say that, it's basically trying to group um, failures. So if there are, you know, today's jobs, there are, you know, 100 failures. Maybe five of them are the same root cause, you know, spread about, you know, a couple of different packages or in a couple of different ways. The advantage to this is that it's generic um, and it is more immediately useful because if, assuming the system is reliable, um, the triagers can go into it knowing you know, instead of having to say, okay, this is this failure, and then look at the next one, and it may or may not, there may or may not be duplicates, just going into things from the start, knowing that these five things are probably the same. Um, you either need to, you only need to triage one instead of five, or you have five sources of information um, to reinforce the same, or to find the root cause of that one issue. Um, is the primary thing, but we also get a bit of a, um, another metric. If we have large failure clusters, say we have, you know, 100 failures in a day and 50 of them are the same, that's a bit of a metric that, you know, there's probably something major that happened. Either some root package was, you know, pushed that broke a whole bunch of stuff, or there's an infrastructure issue, or um, something that is probably worth looking into if, you know, half of your failures in a day are duplicated, duplicates of the same root cause. So in terms of a starting point, um, one of the things I'd said before is there's not a ton of stuff out there on using visual data to classify test results. That is changing a little bit, um, but the stuff that has been coming out is more in the mobile space. Um, so it's similar, but not quite the same. In particular, there's uh, some research that was done in 2021, um, and they published their system and the, what they've done, or what they did, is they had testing that was done on a mobile application, and they had text that came out of it, and then they had video of the test as it was being done. And they went through that, that um, corpus of uh, tests that were done and uh, found the duplicate uh, failures within that. So similar, not quite the same thing, but um, I think it's similar enough to at least start looking at um, and it's probably a good starting point um, to be used for what we're interested in. Starting to gather data, you know, gathering more of it, is uh, instead of the two weeks from the last one, gathering three months of data, which is 154,000 jobs and um, about 1.2 terabytes of raw data. But now we're getting into the part that is the most expensive, which is processing the data. Because in order to do the experiment, you know, we have to go through, find the duplicates, identify the duplicates, cluster them, and then we can start doing um, more of the, the AIML stuff. Um, but this brings us to, and again, like I said, this, this is the major cost. So looking at a traditional machine learning experiment, you need to have all the data up front. You need to have everything classified. An expert has to go through. Um, because, you know, as much as there's a little bit of counterintuitiveness of, well, in order to figure, you know, you need to solve the problem before you can figure out if you can solve the problem. Sort of like, if you don't have a way to evaluate it, there's no way to do the experiment. Um, but in that vein, it, we'd need at least hundreds of examples 
before a model can realistically start learning. In order to get that, we need human experts. And I have it on good authority. Human experts don't like being locked in a room and told, go over 3,000 failures and find me the duplicates.、Um, I, I, don't have any, like, I don't have any peer reviewed paper to, to you know, prove that, but I have it on good authority that they don't like that. So we come to this idea of iterative learning. Um, which is instead of with a traditional experiment where you need to have all your data up front、um, because、uh, the, the, the training process,、um, you forget everything when you start training again. It's a modification of that so that instead of having to do all of your training at once, you,、um, you, know, you train, and every time you train, you get a little bit better in an iterative fashion. And.、Um, After you do, so instead of needing all of the data up front, you end up with, okay, we did this thing, and then we need the expert to go in and say, hey, you know, of these next 20 ones,、um, well, you know, that should have been part of this cluster. It wasn't, you know, this is part of a cluster and shouldn't have been.、Um, but it really gives us this ability to not overwhelm the experts and not have to lock them in a room, which I have it on good authority. You know, nine out of ten experts prefer not being locked in a room and forced to do work.、Um, but th so that's you know, really where it started, but it gives us an additional benefit of being able to change over time. Because the model is learning in an iterative fashion,、um, when new failure modes come up, when new different ways that things can be duplicated come up, that can just, you know, that、um, new information can be. Added to the model and it's learning in an iterative way, and we keep its performance、um, as high as we can without having to be retraining the whole thing all the time. And that's pretty much where we are, we are, where we are at this point.、Um, you know, we we're started in phase two, we have our more general use case, we've gathered the data, and now it's a matter of、uh, being able to、uh, get the setup in a way that doesn't. Make experts want to kill me.、Um, and that's where you know, this is really going.、Um, I never figured out a great transition into this. <laughs> so we're just going to go with the abrupt one.、Um, as part of supporting this, because it's part of Fedora, most of the stuff that's in Fedora is at a minimum supposed to be open source. One of the reasons that this is relevant is the stuff for phase one that was done using a lot of proprietary software. In particular, NVIDIA Stack, which is all、um, proprietary from the driver to CUDA to the, the neural network stuff. And we need to find,、uh, well, ideally, we would find more of an open source solution, which leads into the work、um, that we're doing in、uh, Fedora AIML.、Um, and we're starting to bring more open options for AI acceleration. We're starting with ROCKM,、uh, which is AMD's answer to CUDA,、um, and PyTorch. Uh, work has started. We've got a lot of it packaged, but stabilization work、um, really is ongoing. And、uh, if anyone's interested and wants to help, please come find me because we are definitely interested. I think I finished a little ahead of time, but does anyone have questions? Yeah? Right, I'm not sure I cut all that, but let me, try, let me repeat the question. You can tell me if I got it right. So, as I understand, still the question was、um, you know, we focused just on the visual stuff.、Um, did we consider making smaller models that were multimodal, that used you know, text or text and data to find more problems? Did I understand your correction?、Um, for phase one, no, because the, the, what we were looking at was the unique as aspect. We were specifically wanting to know is, is it worth looking at the visual data? Um, so, for phase one,、uh, no, we didn't really look at that.、Um, in terms of, I, I think it's a side question from, from, what, from what that, or from that,、um, the, one of the big impracticalities of the, the way that we approached phase one is that 
you know, you have to know what you're trying to, like, you'd have to know what model you're, or what failure you're creating a model for before you create it. So there's another level of impracticality with having the, the different models looking for one specific issue. However, for phase two, that is going to use not just visual stuff, because we're getting into something that needs to be practical. And as you pointed out, you know, sometimes there are issues that are only going to be in text, or at a minimum, better found in text. So phase two is going to be using the, the multimodal stuff of you know, both the text and the visual information going forward. Did that answer your question? Cool. Any other questions? Yeah? Okay. Again, I want to repeat your question to make sure I understood before I answer it. Um, so you're talking about um, you know, did I cons did we consider um, like tooling to make the expert's job easier as a as a first result as a, a first place? Um, yeah, you were talking about yeah. I mean, there, you'd specific uh, you know as far as like uh, making it easier from the user interface point of view for them to mark things. Mm -hmm. Um, unfortunately, it's writing some stuff from scratch. Um, I'm in the process of creating that um, because there isn't, I can't think of a better, a, a better way to do that, um, is it's going to be something web-based and it's going to present um, both the, the cluster and the individual failures. And then the expert's going to be able to go through and say, hey, you know, this is supposed to be here um, and wasn't, or this is here and it shouldn't be. Um, so it's going to end up being some uh, custom web application. Um, that goes along with OpenQA. Does that, and so that, that is where the direction we are going in. Did I answer your question? Okay. Other, other questions? All right. I guess I am done about 10 minutes early. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>